Welcome to the lecture on dynamic field theory. This is like the core lecture where we introduce the notion of fields and the main emphasis today will be about uh, understanding how fields are grounded in neurophysiology. So um, to recall uh, what we talked about the last uh, session, we talked about neurodynamics and I derived in particular the notion of uh, a differential equation for activation variables u, which has this characteristic minus u term, makes the negative slope that creates stable states for uh, activation variables. Uh, we, in the, in the lecture, I argued about this being sort of inherited from the biophysics and neurophysics of uh, individual neurons, even though, as you will see in today's lecture, it's actually a characterization more of the uh, something like a collective of, of neurons, a population level of neurons, and it's something like a, a, a population level membrane potential. Uh, so that uh, derivation, if I want a motivation of that equation, the minus u comes from the physics of membranes. And uh, some of you uh, were in my other lecture uh, yesterday where I provided a more qualitative kind of argument why we need this minus u term. And this is what uh, some of you had have an opportunity to uh, do in the second exercise sheet, I believe, right? This was in the second exercise sheet, we, this Einstein argument, as I call that. So important in neural dynamics, in this framing of neural networks as dynamical systems, uh, the inputs to any particular activation uh, system or activation variable are additive contributions to the rate of change to the right-hand side of the equation. So in terms of this minus u for a single activation variable, it means shifting up the minus u characteristic by a certain amount. So that amount is independent of u. So it's a constant relative to u. And uh, as a result, that shifts the attractor states for the uh, activation dynamics toward positive values when it's a shift up. That's, that's why we call that an excitatory. Um, yeah, input because it shifts the attractor into the range of positive values of activation, um, excites that activation variable. Uh, you can have inhibitory inputs, which would be negative inputs that would shift down the characteristic and that would shift the attractor to the left toward lower levels of activation. And then the time courses of activation response to such a time varying, you know, the inputs are time varying then the attractor is moving and the system is essentially tracking the attractor. The time courses are exponentials. Um, they, they will impact, you know, here they, they are exponential if the input is a step function, but if the input has some time function, it's, uh, a, uh, it's the time structure of that input, um, low pass filtered with a Gaussian kernel, uh, with, with an exponential kernel. Okay. And then we discussed also uh, very simple neural networks, recurrent neural networks, a neuron talking to itself, uh, self-excitatory, really a population that's self-excitatory. And then we talked about mutually inhibitorily coupled populations like this that make selection decisions. And so today I'm going to generalize these ideas. You know, these are very, very limited and special kind of populations, but it turns out that the dynamics of these populations are uh, sort of the core of what will happen for our fields. The fields essentially uh, unite these two uh, schemes and generalize these two schemes in an important way. And that's does a lot of work for us. And so <clears throat> concretely, that means that I'm asking, you know, how how do neurons come about? What, what are these neurons about? If I ever write down activation variable, it is um, receiving a certain kind of input. And then we tend to say it stands for that input. Uh, and that just means that whenever there is a certain input, that neuron is activated, is on. And so in that sense, it stands for that input. That notion has been called labeled lines notion or space code. And labeled lines in the sense that you think of the urine uh, re reflecting the input line. And so whenever it's on, something in that line uh, came in and labeled in the sense of you know, the, the, the identity of the urine is uh, defined by the identity of that line. Space code in the sense that different neurons are in different parts of the brain. And then you would say, uh, 
that the location in the brain in the neural networks of the brain determines what the neuron stands for. And I'll elaborate that idea uh, today. <clears throat> so when we ask questions about that, then we want to go, you know, step away from just arbitrarily numbering these neurons and considering them to stand for something discrete and really ask how ultimately does um, neural activation uh, acquire kind of some, some significance, uh, meaning being about something. And that really will mean being about sensor input or being about ultimately motor action generated by the neurons. So uh, the theme will be that the uh, meaning comes from the connections to the sensory surface or to the motor surfaces. <clears throat> and uh, that's how, how you very quickly see that it might be a good idea to abandon this whole notion of discrete uh, units. That's where the fields will come from. You know, initially, you might find it surprising that we're talking about neural networks in terms of fields, you know, spatial, spatially continuous um, activation fields. Um, but if you think about it, there's actually really no evidence whatsoever um, in human psycho psychophysics or in animal behavior even, even in low-level animals like uh, invertebrates, there's no evidence for the discrete sampling of some sensory or motor states by neurons. So you don't see that categorical behavior comes from the fact that they're discrete neurons. There are categorical behaviors, but they're all supported by uh, very large uh, numbers of neurons that are overlapping very often. So the discrete sampling of um, sensory or motor spaces by neurons is very likely just a implementation issue of cells having boundaries and not forming a continuum. And uh, when we want to try to understand perception and action and cognition, we can abstract from that discrete sampling. That's the uh, hypothesis of uh, neural field theory. And there's a tradition of this field, this uh, area of neural field theory, uh, where that is, where that kind of motivation was actually uh, advanced, it's a, a tradition as, in which the fields are introduced through analogies with uh, neuroanatomy, where people argue about, uh, for instance, um, neural neural networks in cortical layers being very homogeneous along the layers. So, if you look at the dendritic trees, overlapping the, the uh, neighboring neurons have overlapping dendritic trees, so they uh, have received similar inputs, and therefore, then the notion was that we could neglect the discrete sampling uh, along these layers and smear out the activation of these neurons along the layers. So it would really an atomic, anatomically based. This goes back to Wilson Cowan, a famous uh, paper uh, in the uh, early 70s. And we often refer to Amari who analyzed these kind of uh, models mathematically. And there are other authors in, in that, Ehrman Trout and other authors in that uh, well, uh, I will be providing a slightly different argument for the uh, continuous space that's based on population code, but it isn't in contradiction. You could think that the neuroanatomical argument is actually a particular way how the population level that I will be talking about comes about. So uh, the, when we'll talk about fields, we will be using the notion that there are continuously many activation variables. So activation field means just a lot of activation variables continuously many. So we go from two to uh, not just infinite, but to continuously many. Uh, so they are um, defined over some dimension. You now to, to span the space of continuously many variables, you can't just give them an index and count them because they are continuous. So you rather you, you consider them functions of something. And this something is a dimension and I'll spend some time now to talk about what kind of dimensions these could be. And uh, the notion is that these dimensions arise ultimately from the location of a particular population modeled by an activation field like that in the nervous system relative to streams from the sensory surfaces and then streams downstream to the motor surfaces. And we use this notion of surface to abstract from the details of the sensors and the motors, right? Uh, I'll, I'll be uh, talking about that in a moment. And so this uh, notion of field is uh, essentially analogous to the field some of you might be familiar with from physics, uh, you know, the electrical field or the magnetic field. Uh, 
those actually are vector fields. That is, they uh, postulate that at every location in three-dimensional space, there's a vector, in this case, also a three-dimensional vector associated with that location that then predicts certain phenomena, like how charged particles would move through Maxwell's equations. You can also talk about the gravitational field. That will be the notion that at every uh, position in space, you have a, a, pot a gravitational potential that's just a single number, like the activation that uh, determines some, you know, how, how a, a small uh, test mass would uh, behave, in which direction would be attracted, for instance. And so activation field is analogous, uh, mathematically, is that kind of object where we're saying that uh, an activation of the kind we've been talking about, you know, this abstraction of neural uh, physical state, activation is defined in a space, and these space will, ha will have varying dimensions. I will be only using one-dimensional examples in the first couple lectures, but uh, later in the course, I will introduce high-dimensional fields, uh, multiple dimensions represented at the same time. I'll give you some candidates now for what these spaces could be. And we'll be looking at the patterns of activation in these fields as being you know, meaningful, we'll say neural representations of something, of perceptual states or of modern states. So how that, that meaning comes about by bringing about the, the, the you know, in, in a way, the dimension by connection ultimately sensor in motor surfaces. So in a lot of cases, we'll say this is a field defined over retinal location or over color or over, uh, let's say, movement direction. And it's one thing to just say that and write it down. And the other is, so how, how is, that, is it actually coming about if in a nervous system? And it's coming about through that free forward connectivity. So I'll uh, look at examples where we see that uh, from some sensory surface, for instance, this could be, let's say, the retina, and this would be the location on the retina. Retinal space would be actually two-dimensional. And then uh, if there's a systematic pattern of connectivity where particular uh, locations on the retina map onto particular locations of the activation field, map in the sense provide input to particular uh, locations, you know, driving activation, particular locations of the field, then we could say that field is over that dimension that the sensory surface delivers. <clears throat> and you could analogously think uh, that if you have a field somewhere inside your brain, for instance, in your motor cortex, let's say to be concrete, um, and it's arranged such that it sends axons ultimately down to the uh, uh, motor periphery driving particular kind of muscles so that when the pattern of activation that's localized in this field arises, it drives the muscle toward a particular state. I've written here, you know, that, that then that part of the field stands for that motor state. Now I've already indicated here that the motor state is actually not just somehow an activation um, pattern, uh, but that it is actually a dynamical system that you have some motor state funds could be, let's say, uh, amount of force generated or posture position or uh, movement direction and uh, something of your hand or something like that. Uh, that. That's actually a dynamical system, a behavior dynamical system. I briefly hinted at that in the Breitenberg example that in the uh, overall, uh, the, your body might create some kind of state and the, your body will actually only move continuously in, in, in its state space. Um, and, and therefore, ultimately motor behavior would involve something like that, a stable state. That will be the a dynamical system with a zero crossing at a particular state that will be the attractor state. And what we could think of is that the activation field actually generates that dynamics. And I will make that idea exact a couple of lectures down, I think maybe two lectures down, we'll talk about how, how we couple uh, fields to motor systems. Um, uh, that actually solves some important problems, uh, normalization problems in computation neuroscience. Um, now, while previously here, I was using implicitly the notion that the sensory surface also has an activation axis and has that activation axis because um, the sensors transduce physical things into activation. Remember, that will be the Breitenberg characterization of a sensor. And when they do that there, the sensors provide activation. And so it's just a question which location in the field they provide that activation to as input. 
uh, while on the motor side, we'll have to take activation and transform it into something motor. And we'll see later, it doesn't do that by just setting the motor system to, to some value. Uh, they do that by creating a dynamical system of the motor state. And concretely in the nervous system, it's actually based on reflex loops. So for instance, muscles generate force, not just by transducing activation into force, but by controlling force through, or the, actually controlling muscle length through the stretch reflex, the peripheral reflex. So in, in uh, the summer semester, I actually have a module where I teach about that, but in, in the semester will not go into these sort of details. Okay, so that's the basic notion of how meaning comes into these fields from the connection to the forward and the back uh, system. I'll elaborate on that a little bit in, in a moment. So just uh, first, let's uh, give you a couple of examples so that you have a sense for what sort of things will happen. Uh, so uh, for instance, uh, very often the dimensions that we'll be talking about are in some sense homologous to sensory surfaces, already talked about the retina as a uh, two-dimensional array that samples visual space, you know, with the optics, it's mappable onto uh, visual space in front of you, given some head position. Uh, very similar ideas are true for auditory space, which is a little bit more complicated uh, in that you have a difference between binaural uh, uh, signals and, and uh, elevation signals, but there are some complicated physics that make that uh, signals from um, the cochlea, for instance, uh, reflects the spatial uh, source, uh, location of a source of, of sound. Uh, they could also be homologous to the motor surfaces. For instance, uh, uh, if you look at uh, where a saccadic eye movement will end in your eye socket or, uh, in a, or even a head movement relative to the body, um, then that would span a space uh, that's a motor surface. And you could think similarly, you know, the end the direction of movement of the of your hand in space, the end effect in space, that, that's a theme in motor control that we're having uh, cortical representations of such things, effector spaces, you know, where the effector is in, in, in space, rather than have, for instance, really directly the muscle lengths or the joint angles uh, available. Other examples that we'll be often encountering are feature spaces. So in the sensory system, for instance, you, where you would uh, extract through feed forward networks features from the sensory surface, for instance, uh, or visual orienta the orientation of edges. I'll give you an example of that. Color is actually somewhat complicated in actual physiology because it's based on an opponency system. But you could also think of uh, motor features, for instance, impedance, the amount of resistance that you will uh, provide to perturbations. That could be a feature and you could have different uh, levels of impedance represented. And then we'll see later in the course that uh, the kinds of spaces that we can represent become, can become quite abstract. The most radical version would, would be to talk about ordinal space, a space in which the serial order of events is represented. That would be maybe thought of as being something discrete and has discrete layers, but actually, actually again, it's just the relative ordering that matters and it's not really necessarily categorical what happens there. We'll see that. So that's, that's this notion so far. For, uh, for uh, many purposes, we'll just think of these dimensions as spanning the metric contents of some space. Um, and we'll not always keep track of how that comes about uh, through the connection to sensor motor surfaces. But when we build models that are supposed to be really, uh, you know, generative that generate from actual sensory inputs, cognitive states or ultimately movements, then of course we have to really uh, make sure that these uh, metric contents is transmitted to the field or from the field to the motor system. Now, the activation axis I mentioned uh, before is, uh, you know, this currency of neural networks. You could think uh, neural networks uh, exchange with, it, with each other really just that, activation. They, some people talk about that as information or sometimes probability or certainty. And that's an interpretation. Uh, for instance, it's an interpretation in the sense that you will find that uh, neural populations representing a certain state will become more activated when that state is quite probable, statistically probable, in the sense it often occurs in that task. Um, or in a motor system, if you're expecting to make that movement, so you're quite certain that's going to be the movement that, I'll, that you'll be making. And that gives some interpretation you know, uh, to that activation, but it's really just activation. Uh, 
and ultimately just drives muscles, right? And, uh, and so these others are just some stories told uh, to interpret these patterns of activation. I want to really make sure that this is well grounded, this idea, because that's what everything else depends on. So here I'll, I'll do a little thought experiment to just show how could you now represent particular perceptual and then motor states uh, using this notion of activation field. So for instance, in here in movement, let's say you have a single you know, speck of contrast, a, dot, a speck of light, let's say, or maybe or, or a dark spot in a, in a, in a light field, um, and that moves, and you could characterize that by three parameters, maybe four, for instance, where it is in the visual array, vertical horizontal position, the direction in which it moves, and maybe ultimately the speed. I dropped the speed here. It turns out that neurally the speed is actually represented very likely in rate code, in how high the activation is, not in, not not as a map, not, not as a field. Mm. Um, actually, surprisingly, it's it's uh, the the fast stuff is less activated. The more activated, the slower. Uh, but that's just a side comment. So, uh, if if you want to represent a percept like that, then you could span these parameter spaces as dimensions. And you could say, you know, I just plotted two, the horizontal position and the mo movement direction. Just for convenience, it will be a three-dimensional field. So it will be a block, block of activation in a three-dimensional field that represents that particular combination of vertical, horizontal, and motion direction. Uh, vertical, horizontal position, and motion direction. And so in two dimensions, it, it's a peak of activation. I've uh, sort of hinted at the threshold, the zero, so only Supra threshold activation will play a role, and so the location of the peak uh, will be, uh, you know, specifying which is the horizontal uh, direction and motion direction of that percept. So, if you have that percept, the model would be you have a peak like that somewhere, for instance, in MG in a the fifth uh, visual area where neurons show tuning to these parameter values. That's the notion. Where you see a, a single peak corresponds to a single object, an object being localized in some sense, localized in feature space, also here in really in visual space. And we'll, in a moment, we'll look at a motor intention being related to a peak. So if you see multiple objects, you might have multiple peaks, but it will turn out that we will argue that there are always only very small numbers of such peaks. And that has to do with the psychophysical reality that you can actually only actively perceive or attend to or direct decisions and actions at a small number of objects, uh, typically four. That's the capacity of working memory. And in, there's a lot of evidence that says that you cannot simultaneously neurally represent uh, more than about four objects, maybe, maybe five. Um, objects are really things that are localized. Uh, they can be events, it can be all kinds of things. They can be intentions, motor intentions again, but localized in some sense and very often localized in some um, space that's homologous to physical space, it's typically 2D. Depth is often dealt with differently in, in, in neural systems. And so it's a, sort of the 2D projection of space onto a motor or sensory surface. So that's a very general picture. It, it sounds maybe very, very specific initially, but it's actually the currency of, in our view, of how um, re perceptual representations and motor representations are linked. Uh, so Based on, on that kind of notion, you can already uh, represent different outcomes of stimulation. I, I just hint at that, so we'll come back to that. So for instance, you could imagine that you have two motions that you see at the same time, like this motion is splitting. That's what we would call transparency in, in motion, if it's the same object splitting into two. That would be then two peaks of activation along the direction of uh, the, the dimension of movement direction. While on the other hand, you could have a um, fusion of these two motion directions where uh, a dot is also splitting two X, but you just see a single motion, sort of an average uh, motion pattern. That's something that is observed for certain patterns, not for individual objects, but for patterns of motion, plat motion. And uh, so then you would have a single peak or you could have a single peak, but it is actually just selecting one motion. Like you're seeing this motion and not that motion. It's very common if you, for instance, um, see a movie 
it's a sequence of still images. So literally this would be the first image you have and then this would be the second image you have. And generally there are a lot of locations on the visual array where the luminance change that you're seeing between two images would be okay to see motion in that direction. So for instance, if you have uh, only these two locations highlighted, the conditions for the gray pattern in one and then the next frame, the gray pattern in the other uh, being uh, related by motion. But when you see the whole picture, you're actually usually seeing a unique motion to just one location of any, any location. So you're making a selection decision and we'll, it will be sort of like for the two neurons, but now within a field that two locations that are excited, only one of them actually is positive. Now you can already see that you can do non-trivial stuff with these notions of localized patterns of activation, peaks. So in the motor system very analogously, you could describe the space of possible movements by a small number of dimensions of parameters, we call those movement parameters, like the uh, amplitude of the movement, which would be the extent of the length of the movement path or some parameter like that. And the direction of the movement of the hand in space relative to some fixed coordinate frame would be a possibility, maybe also the movement time and the amount of resistance to expect and a couple of parameters. Typically uh, way fewer parameters than muscles, for instance, that you have uh, to bring about the movement. And uh, if you think of it that way, then these uh, parameters span spaces. I just plotted two dimensions, movement amplitude and movement direction. And then a, a neural representation of an intention to move this way would be an activation peak that is localized at the right amplitude and at the right direction, localized uh, in some way. Um, and um, I'll show you evidence in a little later that a uh, couple, couple lectures down that I actually experimentally measure something like that. And it really turns out it's, it's a well-defined width. You can measure the width of this. It's not a peak that is arbitrarily thin. It actually turns out it's also true for perceptual representations like that. The, if you see a motion like that, there is a, uh, a peak of a finite size that is not, not a very thin spindle. You can also measure the width of that. For instance, you can do that by seeing a motion and then showing another stimulus that allows you to see two motions, for instance, stimulus sort of, of this nature here. And then you can see if you can bias the perception of that ne next stimulus based on the, uh, the unique motion direction you just saw. And when you can do that, then you must assume that some of the activation from the just previous percept overlaps with the uh, representation of that next upcoming uh, percept. And by varying the relative angle of these different motions, uh, something something's called sometimes motion inertia uh, or perceptual inertia, you can um, see how far you can move, for instance, the movement direction from one presentation to the next and still get a benefit from the activation you just had. And that way you can actually measure the width of that peak. And there are also neural ways to get there. So this peak notion is, uh, is, is not um, arbitrary. There, there is something about the localization per se, which is, means that you are selecting out one out of a space of continuum, it's what we call estimation or specification on the motor side. And there's also the fact that it, it is spread. And that means you create some kind of continuity that is if you change your percept, you change your motor plan, then the neighboring plans are also already activated. Okay. Here's a neural example just to, uh, I'll not explain, uh, explain later in more detail, but just to already make a sort of create a mental image in you. So this is actually a task where monkeys are recorded, uh, are, are doing uh, pointing movements. And uh, in this task, the monkey has to move either up or down. It gets a certain signal, like the filled circle means up and the open circle means down with a hand on a, on a plane. And then you record from neurons in different areas. Uh, this is a premotor cortex. And that's motor cortex, for instance, and uh, over time and using certain techniques, uh, uh, the activity of the neurons is plotted in the space of the movement uh, direction. It's actually using the population techniques that we developed and I'll show you in a little, little while. And you see here that early in the movement in the premotor area, uh, you have activation at two directions that correspond to up or down. And then uh, when the go signal comes a little later, actually that signal tells the monkey if, it, if it's supposed to move up where the filled circle is or move down where the open circle is. So if an op open circle was shown here, then the monkey would know it has to move 
uh, down. And you see what happens is that after a little processing delay, uh, the activation is really inhibited here at that other location and the system generates a peak. In one dimension, this would look at a peak at the location of uh, that, that in that population represents the choice, the actual choice, the, the monkey max. Uh, in the motor cortex, you only see that uh, activation pattern that, that makes the right choice. I will actually show you other data that indicate that even here, there is some information about movement alternatives, but not this kind of qualitative uh, uh, yeah, up down kind of uh, decision. So decision making arises in fields by selecting the location where a peak is generated. And this is directly a direct neural observation of that. So that's the picture that we'll be using. We'll be talking about fields defined over some metric dimension and peaks will be relevant representation will be, we call this units of representation. Uh, so uh, peaks in a way express two things. They express that there is activation, supra threshold, right? Through the sigmoid you know, affecting downstream structures, but they also um, specify a particular value along the dimension, the, the location of the peak specifies that value. Uh, I'll show you that. This moment. So when you have no peak or you have, let's say, a sub-threshold activation pattern could be somewhat modulated. It doesn't have to be totally constant, but it's, it's no peak, no supra-threshold activation that's localized. Then you could say there is no specification of a value. It's not, um, it, 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 it's, it doesn't vote for anything specific. You know? So in this way, representing these dimensions as neural fields is a little bit more general than if you were to represent them by a rate code. Now, if you have a rate code, that would mean that neuron always represents some value. If, you, uh, if it doesn't fire, it represents you know, whatever value is associated with low firing rates. Uh, for instance, a uh, sensory neuron in, in the retina always represents some luminance. Um, and you cannot actually represent that you don't know, that you have no motor plan or that you didn't make a decision yet. Or, uh, so the fields are, uh, much more powerful as you see. They also need a lot more resources. A lot more neurons for just one dimension. So that's the first sweep through that. And now I'm doing a second sweep through that. And I'm trying to uh, now really lay the foundations to the, the nerve physiology foundation. So uh, this will repeat a little bit what I just did uh, up to now, but do it more operationally, more technically. And that leads us to the notion of population code. To do that, let's first think about, you know, in which sense uh, we attribute meaning to the firing of an individual neuron. When we say the neuron represents something, so it has its activity is meaningful. We have actually the same notion that I just argued for the whole field for an individual neuron. It's the tuning curve that um, links to something. And in the new exercise sheet, I'm inviting you to think through this example. So the tuning curve uh, is brought about by uh, presenting uh, to the neuron a, I mean, presenting to the animal, the organism, some task. There could be a perceptual task or some stimulus. Uh, often the animal doesn't have to do anything, but maybe you have a task where the animal has to somehow react to the stimulus. Uh, in the motor case, it could be some motor task. And uh, in different trials, you're varying that task by varying the stimulus of the motor task. And so you're varying something along a dimension, which we call here feature dimension. And then what you will be typically observing is that the uh, activity of that neuron here, for instance, expressed as the firing rate will vary and will vary uh, non-monotonically. When it varies monotonically, we're talking about a rate code. Um, when it varies non-monotonically, you can't do that, right? Here, there would be at the spike level two possible feature values that are consistent with the firing, and you could have a more complex pattern. Um, and so, it's it's not useful to talk about the spike rate as encoding that dimension. But we could say, if you have a picture like that, you could say, well, the the that neuron is sort of representing these values that it that it responds strongly to. So it's, it's, it, it, you could think associate a particular value of the feature dimension or location of, in the feature dimension or, uh, or a range with, uh, with that neuron and say that's what it stands for. And that will of course come from how it's connected to the sensory motor surface. So here concretely, this is the classical paper that established this technique 
and it has some precursors, but uh, this became very famous, Hubel Wiesel, who found that um, in the visual uh, cortex, primary visual cortex, in this case of the monkey, they could identify nice tuning curves to a number of parameters, and those are the parameters that are now considered to be sort of the, the you know, define the construction of the early visual architecture. And one prominent, so generally neurons tend to react good, well to transient stimuli, to moving stimuli. And uh, one of the dominant uh, dimensions is the orientation of, uh, of a moving stimulus, which is sort of confounded with its movement direction. So for instance, if you um, shine a bar of uh, light against the dark background, here plot it uh, reverse in, in reverse contrast, you shine that on the retinal uh, surface within a certain region, this uh, dashed line outlines the region on the visual array where uh, light will drive that neuron at all. Uh, but once you've found that, you, you can move this um, bar along a direction like that and find very little firing of the neuron or uh, along a direction like this and you find spikes. So these are individual spike events recorded from extracellular neurons. So to the neurophysics tutorial how that's done is to see why they're all uniform. It's just some measurement of uh, the electric potential reaching the electrode location. So this reflects a lot of spiking by this neuron. This reflects no spiking. If you look at how the uh, number of spikes per second, so the final rate in Hertz, depends on the orientation of that moving uh, bar of light, then you find a nice tuning curve like this that can be fitted by a Gaussian, for instance, um, that indicates that there is some direction for that uh, uh, moving light that the neuron fires most to, the preferred direction. And often people thought of this as that being the thing what the neuron represents, its preferred value along the dimension, just to speak of. Because it doesn't really make sense to think that only when it fires this much does the neuron actually contribute. And when it fires this much, which also costs a lot of energy, then it, what, is discarded? No, I'll show you in a moment that it actually contributes the whole tuning curve to the neural population. So that's a classic example. And uh, the other thing that was classical was to use as the dimension, the retinal space itself, the location on the retina. And this dashed outline is sort of a by hand estimate of where in the visual space this neuron is looking in the sense is sensitive to inputs. And you can formalize that and I'll show you in a moment how, how to actually estimate the receptive field uh, in a similar form. In the motor system, it's a little different. In the motor system, you have to get the whole animal to do something and vary that what it does and then look at how neurons vary their firing when you vary that motor task. So the famous Jacopoulos uh, line of work uh, consists of tr uh, training monkeys to make uh, directed movements with the hand in space. They had them in the nipple land in their space and they moved in different directions in 2D. There were variants of this doing that in 3D as well. And so the different... Um, Directions here are eight directions that the monkey has learned to move to. And there's some signal that tells the monkey which of these movements to make. And you're seeing here the bottom time courses of the firing of these neurons. Every little mark is a spike. And uh, there are two marks here. One is when the movement is initiated and one is when the signal is given which direction to do. Uh, and this is aligned by the initiation of the movement, but you can also align in other ways. And so what you'll find here is that there is uh, the two things here. There is a modulation of the firing of the neuron as a movement is specified and then uh, executed. Um, and so that's from the fact that these, uh, you know, it looks uh, only here, but in all other cases, it looks like there's a temporal modulation of the firing rate that has to do with task that is reproducible from trial to trial. So for instance, for these movements, uh, the neuron stops firing and then only resumes firing once the hand has reached the target. And for these directions, the neuron increases firing and increases firing before the movement is initiated. This neuron, there's actually some overlap. So even after the movement is going on, or while the movement is going on, the firing is elevated. Here's an example where the neuron stops firing as at an elevated rate uh, level just as the movement is initiated. So these, these neurons have primarily something to do with what happens before and maybe somewhat while movement takes place. Um, 
they are in that sense anticipatory of the movement or predict the movement. And some of these uh, neurons may actually have direct projections onto spinal um, motor neurons. Uh, so um, the other thing you observe, so that's the, the, the that's what, um, these are uh, sort of task related neurons. And uh, you have to realize that any experiment like that, people are actively looking for cells. No? They put an extra in the brain and they're moving it up and down through the layers and uh, while the monkey is doing the task and you get occasionally some firing. You literally put the spike train as an electrical signal onto a loudspeaker. So you hear the, the click, 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 the noise reflecting the firing rate and you're driving your electrodes through that and you're looking for something that modulates its firing with the task. And then you know it's a motor related neuron. Sometimes you will have uh, some firing that isn't directly related to us and then you don't waste your time recording that. So there is the whole way of how single cell neurophysiology works is always some sort of hypothesis testing that you're looking for a particular kind of neuron. And the results are really just saying there are such neurons. Uh, but it doesn't mean that there aren't other neurons that have other kinds of patterns of response that you didn't look for. So the second thing that you see here is that the neuron doesn't fire equally for all movements. So it fires, increases its firing for these directions of movement here, and it decreases its firing for these directions. So it's uh, directionally tuned, and that can be um, again plotted as a tuning curve, the uh, frequency of firing as a function of the direction of the hand's movement in space, specified direction space. And you see it is also a mono, single hump monomodal. Uh, distribution that can be uh, approximated as a cosine function. It's very broad. You know, the, the, the uh, direction is an angular variable. So 360 degrees is the size of the space. And this looks like, you know, a cosine function rather than a cosine of two times the uh, angle or three times or four times. And so it is, it is the broadest angular function you could imagine. And that's of significance. That led to Coppolis to this notion of population coding because it was uh, essentially saying, well, almost all, or let's say half of the neurons that are tuned like that would be active for any given movement direction because half of those would, you know, for half these directions, like these directions, there's increased firing. The other half, there's decreased firing. Actually, other neurons where there isn't so much inhibition, so then you even have more than half having an increase in firing. Yeah, this tuning curves. <clears throat> now, Population is a coding or population representation is a particular way of looking at these tuning curves. And I just want to make that point. The naive label line picture underestimates by far how much information is contained in these firing trends. Now the naive label line picture is to say, if you have this tuning, tuning curve A and B and C, you know, then the neuron A stands for just this value and the neuron B stands for that value and neuron C for that value. And so you would just record from a lot of neurons and then see which neurons are most activated and then look where their tuning center is and say, that must be the stimulus. But uh, what this illustrates is that um, the neuron response you know, has this tuning curve and that reflects that for any given value of the feature dimension, it produces a firing level that is informative about that underlying value. So here, for instance, uh, we're looking at three values that you could present to that neuron. And for each value, you see how the three neurons would respond. Like here, the value one, in uh, which is here, this plot, you see that um, the uh, A neuron, you know, the, the uh, what's that, you know, orange or brownish color here, uh, fires a lot and the green one less and the uh, blue one not at all. And then here, the blue fires a little bit more, the green fires mid-range and the A1 fires a lot and you know, converse to here at that side. So you get a pattern of activation uh, corresponding to these different values. Well, if you look at every individual neuron, you would get its tuning curve, right? Uh, this is a very crude discrete sampling of the tuning curve by sampling at these three locations. And no, what I'm, uh, I'm not explaining, but the uh, background reading I'm providing explains that uh, by based on just these three patterns of activation, you could actually estimate 
which value uh, was present uh, uniquely. You could take these three numbers, these three rates, and if you know the tuning curve, then you, with these, this pattern of three numbers, you could actually determine where along the feature dimension do I have these three values. So the, these three values uniquely, you know, with some, some precision, uh, identify the underlying dimension. So you need way less than you know, a complete sampling of the feature dimension by a lot of discrete neurons. You see, that's where the notion that the discrete sampling by the neurons matters, where you see that, that doesn't actually make sense. And, uh, and what instead, what uh, you find here is that it's the resolution in rate space you know, or, or activation space that matters. You know, how, how, how small differences in activation can you reliably estimate that will determine how uh, precisely you estimate the underlying feature dimension. Um, a special case of this is hyperacuity. Some of you might know that. Um, uh, and, and that's sort of the extreme case where you can see that you might be able to distinguish you know, if, you, if you have just two tuning curves. Uh, so two uh, photoreceptors, let's say, that have overlapping um, space from which they receive light. Um, then uh, by, by looking at the different levels of activation of these two neurons and assuming there is a single spot of light, you could try to estimate where the maximum uh, of that light uh, lies, of that cone of light lies, um, you know, uh, in, in the position of that doesn't, isn't constrained by how far these receptors are from each other. It's actually determined by how precisely can you actually estimate the firing rate. And so that's a new quality comes in when you think of multiple neurons. It's not just crude um, you know, sampling by discrete, uh, the different tuning curves. It's really using the activation uh, space as, as a uh, analogous measure, uh, you know, as a dimensional measure. <clears throat> Um, there has been a decisive study that was uh, really uh, very influential that uh, goes by, by David Sparks' group um, that actually proved uh, that you know even the neurons that are not fully activated really contribute, and that's a very uh, attractive uh, insight. And this was done uh, for subcortical structure. It's colliculus superior that is involved in saccadic eye movements, and uh, that is a subcortical structure that has a so-called topographic map. And that just means that if you look at the tuning of these neurons to saccadic endpoint and to where the saccade ends up lying, then you find that neighboring neurons on the, in a particular layer of the colliculus, neighboring, anatomically neighboring, uh, have uh, neighboring or similar tuning curves. So for instance, here these, these lines indicate that th this is the, the surface of the colliculus, that if you're in, in, in this region, then you will have a uh, neurons that are here will be associated with saccades that go minus 20 degrees and you know, to uh, vertically and uh, let's say 30 degrees to the right. And neighboring uh, neurons will have neighboring saccadic endpoints as their tuning curve. Um, that's called topographic map. Topographic really just means that this is a map from the here the motor space to the neural space, and, you know, anatomy and topographic meaning preserving neighborhood relationships. So neighbors in the outer space are also neighbors on the cortical surface or subcortical surface. Uh, that exists for motor systems. Uh, it exists for perceptual systems. It doesn't have, it, it, as such, it doesn't have functional significance because you know, it's, it's only the neurons and the axons that matter. You could reorder the neurons in colliculus, if, as long as to keep the axons intact, it would have the same function, right? So how they lie on colliculus is more a question of how tangled the axons would get. And it's probably these kind of processes, the growth processes, and the fact we'll see that there's uh, interaction within, uh, across neurons within a layer that also implies that there are cables that need to be axons, you know, that need to be uh, nicely organized that makes uh, that the growth processes lead to topography, to neighborhood preservation. Uh, and, and through that fact, the functional significance then, uh, you know, is reflected in that order, but it's not by itself the cause of that functional significance. Um, 
But because colliculus is topographically organized, you can actually uh, make targeted uh, perturbations. That is, you can actually take a particular population out of the picture um, and then look at the consequences of that. If, if it was all mixed, uh, motor cortex, for instance, is not as clean topographically organized and it's not so easy to target interventions because when you, uh, you know, incapacitate a certain region in motor cortex, you don't know exactly what functional uh, stuff uh, you affected. Here you can. And so what, uh, what these uh, authors did is that they uh, took out a part of the population uh, by actually in one version, it's by cooling. You have this uh, recording electrode and you could put a little um, uh, glass tube uh, next to that electrode and, and put some cold liquid through that glass tube and that cold liquid uh, cools the tissue and the tissue, um, when it's cool, the, the neurons uh, become unable to fire. Essentially, the metabolic processes for uh, the ion pumps and so on are slowed enough for these neurons not to be able to create the ion flux that makes the firing. And, so, and that's very nice because it's reversible. That is, if you just allow the tissue to reheat again, it's not cooling by a lot, you know, it's just a couple of degrees and then you allow it to uh, reheat, these neurons come back online and then you can see, uh, make sure that it's, it, the effect is really reversible so that it's really a functional effect. It's not in some added, you know, that this, through some plasticity or some dying of neurons and so on. And so what, what happens when you cool is that uh, that you can let the most significant is maybe this one. If you take, um, you know, have this population, you make the saccade uh, B, uh, and it's this population that you will find is active, this red circle. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you, if you only stimulate this, you would get D. If you only stimulate this, you would get A. And so when you, when you perform B, you find this, this area is active. If you now cool this sub area, uh, it will be sort of like removing this vector. And what you find is that then the monkey performs a saccade uh, that is closer to, um, is, is, is attracted toward D. So rather than go to B, it's attracted to D as if the votes here for A are missing. That's, that's the, the, the notion. And you can do this both by driving the saccade by stimulating electrically and by driving the saccade by sending a visual signal, which would usually, the visual signal would usually activate that whole population. But now this missing, the saccade goes off. You don't hit the target um, because part of the population is missing. So that proves that these neurons that would be not fully activated when you're asking for saccade B, they would be at the boundaries of hill here and they will be at the outer uh, limits of that hill, but they do contribute. They, they, they prevent this bias from occurring. So from this came the notion that uh, all activated neurons contribute and they contribute to the extent to which they're, uh, you know, correspond to their firing rate. So, so the more they fire and the more they contribute. In the meantime, there have been results like that in a couple of brain areas, uh, for instance, MT for movement directions that I just mentioned, uh, also has topographically topographical ordering of the, uh, of the primary movement direction. This is perceived movement direction now. Uh, and that similarly shows that kind of um, population code signature. And so that's a, um, now an interesting, uh, I, I would say it's a consensus now and there's some interesting subtle issues how to go about that. So people um, have provided now uh, some kind of co competition analysis from which you can estimate how many neurons are needed to specify uh, uh, performance or to predict performance in a way. I mean, so through some statistical techniques and typically people think that you need at least a thousand cortical neurons to get the, the, uh, the statistical quality of the performance. We get the same kind of error, let's say, and same kind of reliability as you see in the performance and the actual organism's behavior. So this picture of population code is now, so it's actually not, let's say population activation as the basis for behavior. It's not, not even clear if it's a code per se, a mapping from some space to something else. It's a 
functional characterization of the brain states that um, best predict behavior, both perceptual behavior and motor behavior. So that's the picture we're using. I want to take you through, uh, to, through two work examples uh, historically at the origin of our approach um, that make this concrete, that is that link this picture of a population uh, of a field, a peak in the field to actual individual neurons that you record from. One was done actually here in Bochum a long time ago. This is when I was first in Bochum, worked with Jeff Janko, who is uh, uh, guiding a group of uh, neurophysiologists at the Institute still today. Um, and this is a recording from AR17, which is the primary visual cortex in the cat. They have these other labelings in monkeys and humans. We call this V1. Um, and it's, it's a representation of a retinal location. Uh, so what you do is, um, you, first you do the classical thing, you measure the receptive field. Uh, one way to measure that is to have um, a uh, more refined, actually by hand you, if you recall, again, you put your extrude in, you get some neurons that seem to respond to light. And now as you uh, focus on a neuron, you're looking roughly where it looks on the retina. Your, your cat is anesthetized, it looks straight ahead, you have to measure where its fovea is and then you, um, find with the hand lamp, you find where the neuron responds, and then you put this uh, response plate uh, onto the um, on, onto your display. And so it's centered roughly where the neuron looks. And by uh, flashing these individual uh, sub uh, units in this uh, response plate, you can measure the receptive field profile. That is how much will the neuron respond to a, a light that is localized somewhere within this array. It's sort of like the tuning curve for space, right? The two dimensional tuning curve. So for instance, for one particular neuron, you're seeing these, um, I think this is uh, 36 uh, possible responses. This pattern of responses, which you can smooth in some way into this, that will be your receptive field profile. It's the analogous thing to a um, tuning curve. And so now you know where this is, neuron is looking in the jargon of these people, and that means where the peak is. Uh, and so here's an example of different neurons uh, recorded that way. So this, this, this white outline is a fixed uh, subspace of your retinal space. The fovea would be here at this location. This is to the right of the fovea. And, um, and these spikes here re reflect the peak locations of the receptive fields of a lot of neurons. Actually, the size of the spike here reflects how much these neurons fired when this particular rectangle here was shown as a, a light. And that's the second idea that I'll come to in a moment that we're then after doing this receptive field profile that individually for every neuron, we're also showing certain stimuli to all neurons. In practice, these are only a small number of neurons are recorded at the same time, maybe up to 10. And for each of those, we measure the receptive fields separately. And then uh, we're, we're showing them a set of stimuli all of, to all 10 neurons. And then we actually repeat that for different penetrations, like you know, different electrode locations. And even in the data, I'll show you across different animals, we're pooling across different animals and just aligning with where the, where the stimuli are on in the visual space of these neurons. Of course, there's some uncertainty, some measurement error and so on associated with that. Now, the, the idea of how to, so this is how we characterize the each neuron. So rather than take the neuron's location in the cortex, we're taking its location in the visual array by taking this receptive field profile. And so now the idea is that we'll be representing every neuron by its receptive field profile. And then um, we'll take the firing of that neuron to one of those uh, stimuli that are shared across different neurons as the weight with which it contributes its, its uh, receptive field profile. Uh, and so when you do that and you smoothen and so on, you get a population distribution of activation, we call that. And these are two different ways of plotting that over visual space. And in general, we did this with a color code where red is the most activated and, and this dark is the least activated. And here you see, uh, uh, for instance, how the population responds to the spot of light that was shown. And you see it's in different locations here in these different conditions. And you see that the center of this peak of activation is uh, tracking, not in time, it's across different conditions. This is sort of matches 
the location of that peak. It's, um, you know, the sampling isn't perfect. So we're getting a lot more neurons you see this here that are along the center line of the display, just, just in terms of us selecting neurons that have the receptive fields there. And so we're not, we wouldn't be as good as further out here. It's just along this line that we get a good estimate. And that's the population representation. It's not on the cortical surface, but you can actually do this on the cortical surface because in visual cortex, you have topography that is neighboring neurons do have neighboring receptive fields. And uh, Jet Yanka has actually since developed this uh, optical recording technique to simultaneously record from the whole area. And he can actually estimate uh, distributions like that as distributions on the cortical surface. And they have a one-to-one -one mapping to where they are in similar space. Uh, so once you have that, you can then actually ask um, different kinds of questions of that population. So it's now, you, know, you have a probe, you know, how you can take a pattern of activation in neurons and transform it into something meaningful, namely a pattern of activation over retinal space and through the receptive field profile, right? And once you do that, you can take, for instance, the time course of activation as now a time course of that distribution. So here, for instance, um, you just take the firing in different intervals of 10 milliseconds at different moments uh, to, you know, and always put that uh, as the multiplier of these receptive field profiles. And then you can see how activation comes up and then goes down again. These volleys of activation are actually transient. And after about 100 milliseconds, the cortex is silent. Um, and you can ask questions as, uh, for instance, does the activation peak sharpen? And then, uh, you, know, you know, is it, and then fade while it's very sharpened or does it actually arise um, uh, sharp and then spreads? And you can get some impression of that here. Uh, I want to uh, explain one particular aspect of that, uh, that is sort of a, a pre or links to what will be uh, studying a lot in uh, dynamic field theory, the inter what we call interaction. And, and that uh, arises when we stimulate with a complex stimulus. We call it complex, just two spots of light. So for instance, you simultaneously show this spot of light and that spot of light to that whole population of neurons. And you have different distances uh, between these two locations. This would be when they're very far and this is when they're neighboring. And uh, what we're comparing here is uh, the actual response, this is the top line, the actual response of every neuron used to uh, weight its receptive field profile. And therefore that's the population representation of that complex stimulus. And we're comparing that to the sort of the interaction free hypothesis where we would just superpose the responses uh, to, these to these same uh, locations of light presented as individual stimulus on one trial and another trial, this one presented uh, individually, right? So this is the superposition of the responses to each component stimulus. Uh, and, and on top, we have the actual response to that component stimulus. So one aspect is clear, if you, uh, if you present uh, the two stimuli very close to each other, then you get a lot less firing in the, to the actual stimulus than the superposition of the responses to the composite stimulus. And you could think, well, maybe because we're adding here uh, firings from the two stimuli and they're uh, over when they're, because the neurons are uh, localized, you know, have localized receptive fields, uh, this will entail some of the same neurons. You could think, well, maybe these neurons are just at their maximum firing rate. So when I add the firing rate from these two trials, I reach you know, double the firing rate and I cannot possibly reach that in this in single trial. So this would be like a saturation effect, a ceiling effect. But then you see the other extreme and, and there you can see with the naked eye that that's not all that happens here because now you see, for instance, that the superposition predicts much more firing around this location when it's uh, an individual stimulus than if it's joint stimulus. And now given that you know the receptive field profiles, uh, we know that the neurons that contribute to this peak are different neurons than the ones that contribute to that peak. So it's not the question that these uh, neurons are a ceiling because uh, they are not uh, driven by this uh, input. And so you see that the actual firing of these neurons is uh, 
reduced in the presence of a stimulus here on the right and vice versa. This would be inhibitory interaction. It would be interaction because it depends now on, um, technically speaking, on stimulation outside the receptive field of the neuron and uh, more plausibly on activity somewhere else in the neural population, what, how they respond to a stimulus. And I'll show that in a little bit more detail um, here. So this is just a one-dimensional cut through this whole system. We're looking at just this location. That's the location that is shared across all these composite stimuli. And we're varying how far in written, written space the second stimulus is removed. And we're looking at the time course of activation at that leftmost location here. And uh, in each case, we're showing with the solid line, the actual response to the composite stimulus with the two locations and in dashed the response to the superposition of the response to the individual neurons. So let's start here at the bottom where it's clearest because these are different neurons than those. And so here, what you see is that the response to the individual stimulus, the dashed line, is higher than the response to the composite stimulus. So that will be really inhibition, inhibitory interaction. The fact that there is some activation here lowers the response of these neurons to their, you know, the stimulus that drives them. And it, it is not observed here in the first rise of the peak, but it is very clear in the main part of the peak. And you see this gradually, this exists everywhere. Even up here, it exists. Uh, and in here you see that this is actually not so much deceiving effect because uh, it is um, you know, almost at the same level of firing. And, but you see this uh, inhibition in the late phase. The interesting also happens here somewhere in between, like here early on, you see more firing to the um, composite stimulus than to the single stimuli, individual stimuli. Now, again, you know, when they're very close, for instance, here, you could think, well, that's just because of shared input, the neurons are neighboring. And so these neurons here, they may, uh, or, or let's say these neurons here, they might be also driven by input from this location. And so that's why they are more driven. But if you go to a situation like that, it's no longer plausible because uh, the neurons that are driven by this input are actually not driven by that input. And so you see this uh, increase in early firing and that will be evidence for local excitatory interaction. So what you actually have is you have uh, a uh, excited interaction that occurs early in processing and you have uh, inhibitory interaction that uh, happens late in processing. And, and the fields actually model that sort of thing. I'll skip over that. <clears throat> so I will, this leads up to me then showing that the, um, in, in the fields, the, there will be interaction among neurons and the local interaction is excitatory and the global is inhibitory. And I will show later that the excitatory contents come up earlier than the inhibitory one. <clears throat> now, uh, a second example uh, is in the motor system. This work I did uh, with Alex Arrives group in, in Marseille a long time ago. And, um, and this is, uh, uh, you will see there's uh, some a qualitative point about that why I'm, why I'm making this. So this is a primary motor cortex. We also did uh, work in pre-motor cortex in related areas, but I'll just uh, refer to Primary motor cortex, so that's an area where some neurons make direct projections into the spinal cord. Mm. And, um, and it's the task of Geogopoulos. We just simplified the task by having only six directions for some technical reasons that was necessary. And uh, it was vertical movement, so movement on a vertical plane, the monkey was sort of pointing at buttons arranged vertically. There's a center home button where the monkey has the its hand initially, and then it actually, in this uh, particular experiment, there are two phases of stimulation. At first, the center button comes on, the monkey has, has to put the finger on that button for the next trial to be uh, started. And then at some point, a so-called preparatory signal PS arises that can, uh, it's either one, two or three buttons that change their color. And that informs the monkey that it's gonna be one of those targets that the monkey will next have to reach to. And then one of those uh, pre queue targets will again change color into something else I don't remember. And the other ones go off and that's the signal for the monkey to then actually 
go to that button and press that button. And they do that very quickly. It's a very small display. When we say Chelsea button, and then the monkey has found out that it gets reward, which is some juice reward uh, when it does the right thing. It has to wait for the signal, not move too early uh, and do the right movement and so on. And the monkeys are, are, are take some time for the monkeys to learn that, but then they are very quick with that. They are very keen on that. They do their couple hundred trials every day. And uh, you know that when they are uh, after, maybe after two hours or so, they stop working. They have had enough juice, and maybe they're also then really fed up with the task. But you can do this for a very long time. They are expecting uh, the treatment. They are ex predicting the time when the experimenter comes, and so on. It's kind of interesting that they are really totally into that task after some time. And so you're recording uh, after you know training. At some point, you operate. These monkeys are chronically um, prepared. That means they have some chamber on the head, so you can put electrodes in and out. You take them out, put them back into the into their uh, living area, <laughs> and next day you take them again, put an electrode in. So it's it's reversible. Actually, at the end of the experiment, you take off that chamber, you put the skin over this little hole, and uh, you know let it heal, and then the monkeys can go and live with. Uh, the monkeys and make children. So the the uh, this is a uh, it's invasive, but it's also uh, it's, it's certainly not uh, you know it's not um, incapacitating or anything like that. Um, so we're recording from primary motor cortex. You know this is the same I showed you for um, the Jacobulus data. So we're looking at the different six different directions in each. We have a time series of these spikes. These little dots are spikes. Um, these trials are ordered. Uh, every line is a trial. The trials are ordered by the moment when the um, hand lifts off the start button. That will be the reaction time. This is the uh, response uh, signal when the, the monkey is told which uh, targets to reach to. So you see some very fast responses. So clearly, the monkey has anticipated and so ready to go. Uh, this is only possible when it knows completely beforehand which target to go to. Uh, you see uh, the modulation of firing. This is primarily, uh, this neuron actually never fires during the movement. The movement occurs between these two markers, markers right? It always fires before uh, the start of the movement, but you also have some neurons that fire during the movement. Um, and it has this tuning curve that is, it fires more to these directions than to those directions. This is a neuron that isn't inhibited. You see, even under these conditions, it's still firing a little bit. It's not going below its spontaneous firing rate. So you see, it already gives you some sense of the variability you have across uh, neural populations. Uh, so what we did, we, we did this uh, same kind of construction that I hinted at in the visual system where we take the tuning curve of these neurons, and this is a schematic. So the tuning curve would be uh, the green curves here, different neurons are you know, localized over different movement directions as they preferred, um, you know, where, where they most fire most. Uh, and when, when we're looking at a particular condition, for instance, here the condition where this movement was made, we're taking the current firing rate under this particular condition and multiply the tuning curve with that. So weight the tuning curve with that for current firing, sum over all the neuron, and then we get this distribution, which we call the DPA, the distribution of population activation. Uh, and as you see in the schematic, it's got to have its peak somewhere where, uh, on the right direction. And it's really just because the neurons whose tuning curve is near maximum here will fire more when this movement is required than the neurons that have their peak somewhere else. So it's not surprising. So this uh, location of the peak is called the population vector in the jargon of Jacobulus. And we, we just looked at the whole distribution. So when you do that, you can uh, you know, just vary the task. So you keep this construction, as we call it, fixed the tuning curve. And uh, it comes from a particular condition in the experiment. And then we can uh, take the current firing rate from just any condition and then keep the constructor um, to make this estimate. It's like you're 
instrument, how you interpret the activity, and, and then you can apply it to new conditions. So here we have just applied it to, again, temporal resolution, taking the firing rate in different time windows, and therefore we can look now at the time course of uh, specification of the moving direction. <clears throat> so you see already here in this case that uh, if you do that, there is a little peak already arising when the pre queue was given, because this uh, pre queue is actually informative about which movements can be made and already has a little peak at the right location, which grows in amplitude as you then approach the response signal. Uh, under other conditions, for instance, there might be two or three initial movement directions you specified, and you see there's some broad pre activation, broader than here and less in amplitude, and then use can see that directly, but what you find is that then there's a little shift from this average position to the correct position when the response signal is actually given. Um, and we can model that now, I don't want to talk about that. So, so, so the same kind of technique can be used. We use this to explain a lot of uh, details of this data. So it's a, it's a good description. And I mentioned this here because uh, this is a case where we're constructing a peak, you know, a population peak from the uh, population. Uh, you know, this is sort of now in the brain, you have a peak of activation, just like our activation uh, fields and we're modeling it by fields. And, um, but it's a peak over movement direction, right? It's not a, a peak that's localized in the motor cortex, not, not over motor cortex, it's over movement direction. And, uh, and so that's more abstract, that's in the task space. Um, and it turns out that uh, the, these neurons in uh, motor cortex are not really topographically organized with respect to that. So if you vary the location where you record the motor cortex, then neighboring neurons don't always have neighboring tuning curves. They, it's just, they probably represent a lot of other dimensions in their two, two mangles to really reflect that. And so the ordering comes only about by uh, this, this function interpretation through the tuning curve. And the um, other aspect of this, this is uh, interesting, is that in this picture, an individual neuron contributes its whole tuning curve. It was actually true in the other case, it was the reserve field profile, but here it becomes just more dramatic because these tuning curves are so broad, uh, right? So, so uh, again, here it contributes a whole tuning curve. So the neuron isn't localized in the field, it's actually smeared out over the field. Uh, so it's in a sense, a more abstract picture than the anatomical picture. It's a picture where we're constructing from a high dimensional space, a representation in a lower dimensional space. We, we could think of this mathematically as a projection onto a single dimension. And uh, you, you could think of the neurons as sort of being basis functions. They span that space. Uh, and therefore, uh, I should actually not use this jargon that we sometimes use, where we say, you know, a location and feel the activation variable is a neuron. It's not a neuron because actually the individual neurons are contributing to a lot of locations according to their tuning curve. It's a more abstract picture. Okay, good. So that's the neural um, <clears throat> grounding of these sort of things. And, and so in most cases, of course, we're not able to do, directly do that. It's, only been these special systems where we have access to individual neurons and correlate them with percepts or with actions. In general, it's this, but the general idea is still the same. It will be ultimately that kind of connection to sensory and motor events that would um, set up the fields as being about certain dimensions. So in the, in the last few minutes, I just want to give a first impression of neural dynamics in such activation fields. And then we'll be elaborating that over the next couple of sessions to uh, link the dynamics of these fields to different uh, experimental signatures of such underlying neural mechanisms. So uh, essentially we'll be looking at time courses of activation and model them mathematically as neural dynamical fields. And the time courses will typically uh, take us from some initial shape of a field, we call that pre-shape, that initial meaning before a uh, stimulus arrives, some input arrives that drives activation to a new state. And then uh, ultimately would evolve toward a peak because the peaks will be in this uh, conception, attractor states of the neurodynamics of that field. And the notion of the attractors as uh, of, of peaks as attractors mm. um, is directly 
linked to interaction, the kind two, two interactions that you're familiar with now from last lecture, the notion that uh, locations in the field that are neighbors uh, have overall excitatory coupling that essentially prevents peaks from decaying. So if, if you have a, once you have a peak, the different locations in the peak will activate each other, excite each other, and they will keep activation up. While if you have locations that are far enough from each other, then we will uh, postulate that overall they are interacting inhibitorily, and that will make selection possible. So for instance, if you have input that is localized over two locations, then uh, activation in one of those locations might be suppressed by activation at the other location. So this peak inhibits that location. And because that location would be below threshold, it cannot co conversely uh, inhibit that first location. That's how selection would be happening. Right? So the picture you had so far would be embedded in the field like that. So the last argument involves Again, the sigmoid recognizing that only activated locations of the peak, uh, the field contribute. And the first argument uh, involves some kind of distance dependence of the connectivity in the field. So rather than say there are two different populations, excitatory and inhibitory, we, we say there is a dependence on distance in the field of the coupling strength. So close distances around here, the zero axis, X minus X prime, small distance in the field. Uh, you have excitatory uh, connection and if you're far from each other you have an inhibitory negative connection <clears throat> and could fall off with a very long distance we sometimes call this mexican hat this is more like a canadian hat perhaps mexican hat would be if it comes back up after and when you're far enough then there's no interaction that also sometimes is a good model so these two ingredients essentially lead to peaks being attractor states uh, uh, I'll take you to the web page that you're already familiar with, right? The, this web page, the dyingfield.org web page, actually has a simulator for fields right here uh, on top. You can actually induce with a mouse some inputs, and uh, you can, like, you see selection here, and you can actually boost and very fancy. There's some explanation here if you go to put your mouse here. But this simulator is a little tricky sometimes to use, so I'm using the more academic simulator under live simulators. We played with the two neuron simulator in the last lecture, and now we're looking at the one layer field simulator. And you can do that all at home if you want. Uh, you can load a particular interaction profile. I, I use the selection profile. Uh, so here in the bottom panel, you see the kernel, the, this interaction kernel that I just plotted. So it's plotted as a function of distance in feature space or in you know, whatever that space is. So this is zero distance. and here is zero, so this is positive, excitatory, and for distances that are larger than about six or seven, you see it's inhibitory. inhibitory. You can control this um, uh, kernel, you can change it by, for instance, uh, moving uh, these sliders around and making it more inhibitory. I can make a Mexican head kind of thing, like a local inhibitory kernel. I can drive up the excitation. Um, no, I don't want to do that. I go back to this default one. The field is here shown here on top. It's the blue line. Um, I have some noise going here, so it's fluctuating a little bit. Uh, the red line is actually the sigmoid applied to the blue line. We call this the output. And currently it's sitting at zero because there's no positive activation anywhere. And there is a green line that is just below the blue line right now. That's the input including the resting level. So the field has a resting level here of minus five. I'm moving it around just so you see it. Yeah, it has a resting level. And we're plotting the resting level plus any inputs. Uh, and so currently the blue is on top of the uh, green because you know the resting state is where u equals h. So u is equal to the resting state. u dot equals minus u plus h. Now, if u dot is zero, you can put u to the other side, u equals h. But now I can actually induce uh, uh, peaks here. And uh, I have three sliders here for uh, Gaussian inputs of a certain width that you can control certain position and certain amplitude. So I'm uh, uh, pushing up, you see here, a little Gaussian here is coming up, pushing up and the field is sort of live, you know, with a delay that just reflects the numerics, live um, coming up and tracking that input. And you see when I have a little input, uh, 
the blue is always on top of the green. So it's always, you know, the same equation, u dot equals minus u plus uh, h plus s. So if u dot is equal to zero, the stationary state fixed point, uh, put u to the other side, u equals h plus s. So it's still the blue equal to the green. But when I go high enough, like here, this is the detection instability, right? You're familiar with that. So what happens here is that this uh, u equals h plus s, so you, just the input uh, defined solution becomes unstable and a new solution becomes stable where there is more activation than input. And that more activation comes from this excited joint interaction. And you see that uh, here the sigma returns something. It's a pretty sharp sigma. So at the edge of the peak, it goes to its saturation value. It's actually the, the red is plotted on different scale because it's really one and, and it's plotted uh, 10 times larger, you can see it. So uh, it's um, uh, the, this, the supra threshold activity is here that has two effects. It ex ex excitation within this area lifts activation up above uh, input level and then um, it inhibits activation everywhere else below resting level. So this is from the inhibitory part of the current. You can see that if you, for instance, uh, vary the inhibition, vary that a little bit, you know, if I make it larger, then you see the, the inhibition varies with that, right? Actually, I don't want to mess it up. Let's go back to, to this parameter set. <clears throat> So that's the detection and, and the, the bistable regime of the detection that uh, you, you, uh, we talked about last uh, week uh, for single neurons is observable here. If I lower input, like I lower maybe to this level, now I'm at a level where input doesn't actually reach zero. So if the blue is on top of, of the green, there is no super threshold activation, but the peak is still around. So this is actually a bistable regime. You can observe this by resetting, which resets the field to resting level. And you see now it stays in that solution. So at that level of input, there are two solutions. There's the sub-threshold one and the supra-threshold one, which is a peak, right? So I go above, then go back below. And now I have the other solution. This by the regime has a limit. So the ejection stability is, is the limit where it becomes monostable and maybe only peak. And then the reverse detection stability is where it becomes monostable and maybe no peak. And that's what uh, ha happens here at some lower level. So somewhere here, the peak loses stability. Maybe right here with noise, I will switch out of it somewhere here. And then it goes back. Yeah. So that's the monostable off state. Yeah. So, so the peak does what these individual neurons uh, did the self excitatory neurons, it goes through its detection instability to bring about a peak and it goes through reverse one to, uh, you know, to get rid of the peak. That is very fundamental in DFT in dynamic field theory. We'll be uh, do, using this all the way through the semester. Uh, and you will later see a very important feature of this is that it translates time continuous change into an event. So for instance, if I were able to move the slider here uh, continuously in time, which I barely can, then there would be one particular moment when this event happens. You see it's an abrupt change and the peak becomes present and then downstream structures would now suddenly get input. And you will see that role of the detection stability lot in the, in the rest. The, uh, this system can also do selection decisions. So for instance, here I'm bringing up uh, input at a second location. Uh, in fact, it's even a little larger than, um, that's maybe like this here. It's actually larger input than at that location, but the field has selected this location makes a self-stabilized peak here. We call these super threshold peaks also self-stabilized. Uh, and the inhibition from this uh, self-stabilized one suppresses activation here, so you're quite a bit below zero, so you can't get this peak. Uh, to win. Uh, so this is what we showed at, looked at, at in terms of two individual neurons, one neuron suppressing the other neuron. Now we see that for two locations in the field. Um, the reason why this peak came up first is because I moved that slider first. 
And so uh, this uh, location had a chance to get uh, up above, th above threshold before the other one had, and then it can begin to inhibit the other location. But uh, it's also, it's not totally unrealistic, it's also how selection decisions happen in, in actual nervous systems when a whole pattern of input arises at the same time and different uh, locations in the population match that input to different extents, for instance, for classification decisions. And uh, what that will mean is that certain locations where it matches better receive effectively more input because of this better match of the synaptic pattern to the input. And when they receive more input, they will rise to um, the threshold earlier and can begin to inhibit the other location. So even though the other location might actually also have a good enough match to create some supra threshold activation, it will not because it is inhibited in time by the matching location. That's a very generic way of how selection decisions are made in nervous uh, neural networks. And in many cases, people just from the outside pick the location that's most activated and say that's the winner. And takes all means that it's the only thing you transmit, uh, but that's the underlying neural mechanism. Uh, limits to this uh, temporal ordering effect. So if I just push the other location to be even more activated, then it overrules this initial selection. And if I go back to the same level of input as this location or even less, I can now uh, sustain the selection decision. So uh, again, there's a bistable regime, in other words, for the green input pattern, there are two solutions, either the left peak is on or the right peak is on, both of these are possible. Up to a limit, again, I could also, you know, destabilize it in the other way, this is the end of that bistable regime. A third feature I want to briefly hint at that we'll come back uh, to later is uh, working memory. I, I'm not sure that I'm not in the regime here, I guess for working memory. So, so here when I, remove the input, the field goes away. So the input, it's a self-stabilized peak, but it's still, the reverse detection instability is still there. So when I go to zero input, the peak goes away. But I can create conditions where that reverse detection instability is not encountered uh, on my way to zero amplitude. The cheap way to do that is just to push the whole field to higher resting levels. Cheap in the sense it makes it easier to go across threshold, easier to reach uh, across threshold. Uh, the more sophisticated way is to change the interaction kernel. Um, but I don't want to do that now. And so I think I'm already in that regime here where uh, the peak is sustained. So I'm reducing the input to zero. And now there is still a peak here at this location. It's only there because at some earlier point, I induced the peak through detection instability. And it persists, the bicycle regime exists, uh, persists all the way down to zero strength and now this is particularly dramatic because this is now a totally unmarked location right where uh, activation is around for no very very long times way beyond the typical time scale of the fields just reflecting that history so it's the standard model of working memory it's called sustained activation there's some hint in the brain that neurons can sometimes fire when the inducing stimulus is gone uh, the neuron so is much more complicated than this one but um, this is a pretty decent model with some modifications that have to be made to account for some subtleties. But roughly, this is the story of how activation is, stays around inside the nervous system without input. And it's actually a very dominant picture. We'll talk about that a lot, that most of the activity in your brain is actually of that nature. It's most of the activity is not induced by inputs. It's, the inputs are actually quick, brief transients inputs for, you know, when you make a saccade or when there's a auditory transient or something on your skin. Uh, and in between, uh, all your thinking and coherent acting is based on activation generated inside the nervous system. This is the simplest kind of that interaction that just stays put at a particular location. Last point I want to make about that. Um, and maybe go back to this parameter setting here um, is <clears throat> Is the following subtle thing. I, I used to simulate in somewhat, it's a little bit of a misuse. I'm putting in a little bit of amplitude here at three locations. 0.2 is the amplitude at three locations. You don't see any difference, right? It's very small. And, uh, and so you can think of that amplitude as some kind of little bias that the resting level is different at these different locations. 
as a result of learning, or you could think of that as reflecting some subtle sub threshold input from somewhere else that uh, isn't sufficient to induce any peak. And uh, what I want to demonstrate is now that I can push this system through the detection instability without actually giving any localized input. I can do that, for instance, here just by boosting the resting level, but in general, it would be by giving some constant input to the whole field. And if I do enough of that with some noise, it will generate a peak. It generates a peak at one of those three locations. Here, this location is 25, so it's centered here on 25, pretty much. And uh, if I repeat that, you know, maybe uh, bad luck does the same thing. And then maybe if I'm lucky at some point, it will generate a peak at some other location. That already looks suspicious. Okay. At some point, I wonder if I have some slide. Yeah, right there. <laughs> go somewhere else. <laughs> so uh, with some luck, it will come up with a third location. No, try it again. Uh, doesn't want to go on. And, and it's possible the middle location is a little bit disfavored because it gets inhibition from two sides. I'm not sure about that. Uh, yeah. So uh, this is interesting for multiple reasons. One thing is, it shows that the interaction creates the activation pattern, right? The input is minimal here, the localized input. And, um, and, and thus you could think of the detection instability as amplifying small inhomogeneities. So these three locations are special, really just you know, in a very minor way. And what the, um, the system uh, does can, uh, it can amplify that into a macroscopic difference in activation. Um, and this, the second thing you would learn from this, so, so, so this uh, really reduces the demands on learning. If you think of the, uh, these, you know, the, this little uh, inhomogeneity arising from some learning rule, it would be uh, much less that has to be achieved by the learning. It's just uh, able to bias input a little bit and you can amplify the result of the learning into a macroscopic peak. So this peak isn't really any different from a real peak when I have some real input here. And the other thing you, you learn from this is that categorization is cheap, right? The, the, it's actually the expensive thing is that all the field locations are equal. It's very it's easy to get you know, homogeneous into, into the field by learning uh, synapses you know, evolving differently. And, and um, therefore the fact that we assume that there are these continuous fields doesn't mean that we you know, have trouble getting the system to behave categorically. Actually, the trouble is how to get it to behave continuously if we have learning in the system. Good, so that's, I think, as much as I want to use the simulator now. And with that, and you, you can all go to that web page, page and try to reproduce those uh, effects. And I'll do an exercise on that next week. Um, and I'll start at this point at next week. I want to end by connecting to the previous lecture. Let's skip all that. Uh, and uh, just make sure you understand that what we did in the single neuron lecture was actually in hindsight, really not about individual neurons. It was about particular regions in the field. So we were looking at a particular region we called then U1 and the interaction within the peak is what we modeled by self excitation of that neuron. And we're looking at some other location in the field we call U2 and the inhibition between those locations that was really the inhibition in the field. And so it would depend on, on how far these locations are from each other, how strong that inhibition would be under different conditions. You can see that that picture with discrete neurons isn't, isn't so strong because um, we have to figure out um, how strongly they interact as a fun they inhibit each other as a function of how far they are apart. But, but you know, when, the, when it's two category labels, uh, it, it shows up as the connection strength depending on something in the stimulus, right? And that doesn't really make sense. And when we embed it in a field, then we understand what's actually happening. It's the forward connectivity that sets up what these different activation patterns mean and the interaction is actually global. It's a fixed uh, function of distance in this represented space. Good, so with this, I close today's lecture.